Uh, my name is Brian Weiser. I am a professor of biology and the chair of the Department of Biology, uh, Marine Biology and Environmental Science. And it is a real pleasure to welcome Josie Island uh, here this evening. And I'm so glad so many of you are here um, so that you can see some of the fascinating things that Josie's going to share with us. Um, it's, uh, I, it, it, is, it is an enormous pleasure. I don't think you could possibly understand how cool it is to have Josie here. Um, and I discovered her first book, there's a copy of it in the back, um, back in 2014. And I will tell you, it changed the way that I teach um, because her work is so cool. And in the Venn diagram of Josie Islin and Brian Weiser, we are like hugely overlapping. But we got here from very different pathways. And so Josie's gonna share some of that with you today. But before we move on, I did wanna acknowledge our sponsors. Um, this um, is, is uh, supported by a number of different organizations. One is the um, RISE Scholarship Program, which I'll talk a little bit about um, in just a second. Um, I want to thank um, Betsy Learned and the Talking Beyond the uh, Library uh, series, uh, which has uh, supported this in large part here. The um, Honors Program, the Department of Biology, and the MS Seminar series all um, helped to get Josie here today uh, to share her work with us. Um, I just wanted to quickly acknowledge. Um, the NSF uh, grant that is also supporting uh, this work. This was a, um, it's called a Scholarships in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math program. Um, and this is a program that awards uh, scholarships um, to students. Um, and it, the, the tenets of the program are to address the need for a high quality STEM workforce and STEM disciplines. It funds scholarships and advances the adaptation, implementation, and study of effective evidence-based curricular and co-curricular activities support recruitment, retention, transfer student. Blah. Okay, so this is a great program, it's a scholarship program, but it's also a research study. And the, um, the PIs on this are Dr. Palm, who's in the back, um, and uh, Karen Bellotti, who's at the uh, Writing Center, director of the Tutoring Center, um, Tracy McDonald-Weiser, who is the coordinator for the Science Center, who's not here um, today, and then myself. And um, what our research question is, is does programming and science communication improve retention, graduation, and placement into STEM careers? And so part of the reason that we have um, Josie is just because there's some algae guy who knows her work, um, but because we, it's part of the programming of facilitating science communication and learning the importance of science communication. And we know we have a very strong need to communicate effectively to, that, and, and a, a very strong need for the public, um, non-technical audiences, a lot of public's interest in science, but understand science because it's good for society. This is something that our national government recognizes in uh, implementing programs like this STEM program. And we are thrilled that we get to be part of this program support student work um, and uh, test this idea that science communication is something that will help people to identify in the field, stick with it, get jobs in it, and move our society forward. Um, so as I said, um, uh, Josie's first book on the uh, left here, An Ocean Garden, The Secret Life of Seaweed, uh, was published in 2014. That's when I became aware of, of Josie's work. And what I absolutely love about Josie's work is that it is a very welcoming, entry into a discipline that a, a lot of people go, oh, I gotta take a class on seaweed. Um, it takes some convincing of your parents, a lot of money to take a class on, on seaweed. Uh, because the way we often hear about it is the dead stuff that washes up on the shore and then it smells and it, you know, it's like, bleh. But not Josie Islin's work. It is fantastic, it's breathtaking. Um, it's really cool, so she's gonna tell us about that. And she just came out with a new book um, that explores um, several different species in much greater detail, tells some uh, stories about it. It's called The Curious World of Seaweed, and that's what we're here to hear about today. Um, but so by way of introduction, I did want to just say, highlight a few things about this book, if you haven't uh, read it yet. It's been described as a mesmerizing swim through a liminal world, a remarkable mixture of photos and writing, an important work well done, an adventure through art, science, and pure pleasure, which I could not agree more. It's fantastic. So Josie's a photographer. Um, she has you know, full art installations, and um, she's also a designer, I would say. Um, so here, some of her work has been used on uh, beauty products, um, scarves, and I believe that is the scarf that Josie is wearing today, so you can get up close and, closer. and check this out. So how many architecture people do we have in here today? All right, so all you guys have to go to your archie friends and tell them about how seaweed is making it into the design of a stairwell concept. 
Um, and that's a, a, a very new project, I think. Maybe we'll hear a little bit about that. But Josie's also an explorer. She goes out and looks at the world and tries to make some sense to that and bring uh, really interesting narratives to it. That's her Instagram feed. Totally check it out. It's awesome. Um, <clears throat> and she goes to scientific meetings as well. Um, she's a former Roger Williams University um, student who was at a meeting that uh, Josie was also at. And, uh, and so it's just really fun to, to talk with Josie and sort of we're, we're at this point where we, we've arrived to sort of the same um, place but from very, very different pathways. And I think you'll find it really interesting to hear more about her. Um, and if you are interested in following um, any of the work that we're doing in here from RISE, you can follow us on Twitter at Speaking STEM. Um, so if you photograph, take any portraits, which the specimens in the back, which you should totally do, um, tweet them out and, and uh, tag us at, uh, at Speaking STEM. And without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Josie Island. <laughs> Hear me okay? Yes. Great. Awesome. I think those are mine. I'm gonna keep so I'm gonna actually going to stand out here because I don't want to be lying there. Um, and we're going to pull up. Uh, and maybe we can put down the fun lights. Yeah, yeah. So um, I am so delighted to be here at Roger Williams. This is really one of my favorite places to be. Brian is just amazing. Um, I think there is one graphic design student in the room, so I'm glad, you know, this is a place where art and science comes together. And that's really my passion, is um, bringing art and science together. And I actually come to the science as a visual artist. I have no formal training in the sciences. Um, I got my undergraduate degree in what's called visual and environmental studies from Harvard, but that environmental studies has nothing to do with environmental science because in the early 80s, environmental science, I'm not sure it actually existed at Harvard University. Um, it was the program I was in was run by a bunch of architects and I spent my entire undergraduate career in the darkroom making photographs and weird constructions from photographs. Um, and then uh, I worked in the art field of architectural lighting for a little while, uh, and I moved to California, and then I went back to school to get my MFA, so that's um, a master's in fine art, uh, in photography from San Francisco State University. And just as I completed uh, that master's program, which was really pretty fantastic, um, and I was doing all this work using glass block and transparency and images that looked through images to other images, I discovered the use, I started using my scanner as a camera. And that had a lot to do with that. I had a lot of small kids at home, and I couldn't be in the dark room. And I happened to have bought a scanner with some of my colleagues that I was doing some collaborative work with. And I started putting objects from my world onto the scanner. And the scanner has become my tool. And so what I thought I'd do today is take you a little bit through my journey as an artist into the science of seaweed. Um, so, um, when an ocean garden came out, I, uh, I, I came here and I did a talk and I thought I'd kind of really concentrate on my journey since then, but um, it all began with making these very straight ahead portraits using my scanner of the marine algae that I was finding on our west coast. Now I also want to say that I'm so happy to be here on the East Coast. I um, have lived in San Francisco for a long time now. Um, uh, I moved there a couple years after I got out of college. Um, and uh, and um, so I, I could make a decision when I was putting this talk together as to whether to make the talk more kind of East Coast centric or to really leave it as the presentation that I've been giving quite a few of out uh, in and around uh, San Francisco and California, and I decided to leave it a little bit West Coast centric because I've noticed that we all, there's so much incredible work being done on what's in front of us and what we're encountering in our local, local worlds, especially, you know, our, our near shore ecologies. And it's often good to kind of step back and get a broader sense and hear what the stories are from away, from somewhere else. And that might give us some perspective on what's happening here. So um, it's kind of 
Um, it'll hopefully get you all out to California or get you psyched to go come do some work out in California. Um, but that's, so, so to go back to where, uh, where I started with the seaweeds, is I started using my scanner as a camera in, way back in 1994. And at one point, um, I was training to be a docent for one of the new marine protected areas just north of San Francisco called the Duxbury Reef. And so I was doing the training to kind of learn what the reef was all about. I had made a few books uh, on, one was on beach stones and another was on seashells. Uh, and then I made a book about everything you find at the beach. Uh, and I wanted to kind of expand what I was looking at. So I was taking this docenting class. And I noticed that everyone out there, the woman who ran it was a nudibranch expert. Um, so everyone was looking at the invertebrates and the, ooh, they were so excited by all these invertebrates. And I was noticing that most of what we were looking at was not being talked about at all, and that was the algae. Um, so I picked up a scrap and held it up to the sky, and I was like, oh my god, this is so spectacularly beautiful. It was this incredible magenta color. It was this incredible form. I, was, I have to get this back to my studio and onto my scanner, and that started my journey, which was very, very much of a visual journey at first uh, into the world of the seaweeds. Um, when I was on the, on, on the beach in, in California, I, I can't help but pick up these pods, these beautiful orange-shaped pods. I had no idea what they were. Well, now I know that they are the pneumaticist of the macrocystis, which we'll talk about. But that's to say that I begin as a visual learner. I did not, um, I was not good at learning names in college, um, so I kind of didn't go into the sciences. Uh, but um, I've become impassioned by the seaweeds, and so I've stuck with it, and I've learned, I've learned the science or a tiny bit of it. So I've been making these straight-ahead portraits of using my scanner. And then, since um, making the book uh, An Ocean Garden, which I call kind of a visual primer on marine algae, uh, I started printing them on these curtain, this curtain material. And this is an installation for a gallery in Alameda, California. And so I'm able to bring these large, oversized algae into art spaces and into other venues uh, that wouldn't kind of normally encounter marine algae. Um, and so just to, to let you know what we have here, I think I might have a pointer on here. Maybe this, ah, uh, yeah. So this is a beautiful erythrophyllum, um, which we'll encounter a little bit more, a rosy red, the fabulous agresia, and we'll encounter that more. Um, this is a West Coast palmaria. Um, you have something similar. And this is the great macrocystis or giant kelp. And these are each 94 inches high um, uh, and hanging in the gallery. These curtains have been a fantastic thing for me. They're easy to print. They're easily transported. And um, the, the community um, arts program of, of the county of Alameda had an empty shopping center that they were trying to revitalize. And they asked a bunch of artists to fill some of the empty storefronts. And I was given an old video store. And as you know, video stores are like dead in the water. This place has been empty for years. Um, so I came in with my big algae curtains and uh, got to fill up the windows. There was a huge festival in that place. There was uh, children's performances and bands playing. And um, it, was really, uh, it was really great. Um, and you can even, so that's the giant kelp. Here's from the outside, uh, the Nereocystis, which is one of the stories I'm going to go into in great detail. That's our bull kelp uh, of Northern California uh, and that palmaria. And just having the public encounter these organisms that are so unfamiliar, that are really usually hidden beneath the waves, uh, was really thrilling to me as an artist. This was a super fun uh, um, installation. And this happened in, in the spring of 2018, as you can say, see there. And I was invited by Brian and Amy Carlisle, who organized the Northeast Algal Society's conference uh, for that year. It was at um, the University of New Haven. And I was asked to come in and do an installation in the gallery space and, um, and give a, a kind of introductory talk for that conference. And the, the algal. Um, uh, conferences and, and groups, the sci algal scientists have been so generous and enthusiastic about inviting me into their world. Uh, and it's a great honor and pleasure for me 
uh, to uh, come and, as, as Brian said, their mantra for that year was broaden your impact. Um, so one way is to, um, is to install this work in ways that was, it really kind of enlivened this. It was a funny gallery uh, layout. Uh, and so what we have here on the curtains is some Botryocladia over there, this beautiful sea grapes, and then a fabulous, uh, I think it's a brown, is a cytosiphon. Uh, it's like sausages, um, and I just love that one. Um, and then I got to do a talk similar to what I'm giving you in the gallery space, and that was where all of um, the conference convened to, sh to, to um, start off the conference. Another great part of that conference was that I got to make these prints also for the walls that were big fine art prints, but they were actually printed in Brian's lab. And that's a wonderful confluence of art and science is that you know, science labs have beautiful printers, and if you order some good paper, I can put some files up on Dropbox, and Brian printed out these beautiful files uh, that then ended up having a second life at the big national algal conference, the PSA, the Psychological Society of America. They hung behind the speakers. These prints hung behind the speakers at that conference. And then they went into an auction to support scholarships to the conferences, and they made a bunch of money for. So this kind of play between the fine art and the science is just such, uh, it's just a pleasure. So as I said, I was using my scanner to make these very straightforward. One of the things I love about my scanner is it strips away the context um, and the scale, and it lets these organisms really speak for themselves. Uh, the scanner also gives me very true color. Um, so what you're seeing here is really the color of the algae. I kind of bring it to life. Um, but I really, I like that consistency. And if any of you are photographers, you know how weird lighting can be and how um, it, it, can, it can veer from <laughs> what you're looking at. And the scanner, it's very true to my specimen that I'm placing on there. This again is that fantastic erythrophyllum. Um, there's a wonderful psychologist out at University of British Columbia who has a tattoo of the erythrophyllum on his forearm and it's beautiful. And lately, I've been trying to make these more complex imagery that has um, uh, a little bit of abstraction in it, but I always want to make this, this species or specimen itself identifiable. So I'm mixing that erythrophyllum with some prionetus, I think, here, and mazielas, and it's all about the purples and browns coming together. Oh, and this is the fabulous halosachion, or sea sacs. Uh, and Brian has some of these in the back, but this is what they look like when they're fresh, when they're right off the beach. And I have one beach that I walk very regularly in San Francisco, and what I've noticed over the many, many years that I've been walking is that there are certain days that certain seaweeds wash up on the beach. And every once in a while, there's a halosachian day, and, and the beach is strewn with these lovely celadon seaweeds. They're actually in the red category, which I'll get into in a minute. But uh, this, you can see they have some of the ocean still with them. And the sea sacs are really interesting because, as you know, these seaweeds exist in the intertidal zone, this kind of weird place where their entire world gets stripped away every six hours. And they have to, if they're, if they're in the higher intertidal, they have to kind of survive during that desiccating period of low tide when the sun and the wind is extremely drying. So they all come up with different strategies uh, for surviving that period, and the sea sacs hydrate from within. It's kind of a different strategy from those really leafy, um, leafy seaweeds that, that dry out and rehydrate. So you can see they have whole little oceans uh, inside of them, um, and that's uh, what I'm able to capture with my scanner. So I can put these seaweeds on my scanner wet right, out of the, right off the beach, um, or I can put them on after I've dried them in my press. This is a fun, this is a two historical uh, pressing. So I'm also able to go into herbaria and scan uh, pressings from the 1890s. These seaweeds have this incredible, um, they're, they're uh, very archival. They last a long time and their pigments last as well. And then I've overlaid, this is Gloeo siphonia and it was pressed in, 18, in the 1890s. Somewhere around 1898, it's from the Monterey Peninsula. Um, and it has some other color in there. So here's where my, my, my eye as a designer just has so much fun. Um, this Maziella volans is a particular spoon-shaped, I mean, it's just incredible. Look at it. It's really that purple color and this 
fabulous spoon shape. Um, and I found it one of my first workshops that I took uh, when I started learning the science of seaweed from the curator of marine algae at UC Berkeley, Kathy Ann Miller, uh, was at one of the, marine, the big marine labs near me at Bodega Marine Labs on Bodega Head. And that was way back in 2009, and I found some of the Maziella volans, and it's in the book, and it's, scant, it's just beautiful, and I never found it again. Until two years ago, these workshops came back to the Bodega Head, or Bodega Marine Labs, and there was a beautiful cluster of the Maziella volans. And Kathy Ann pointed out that this seaweed, it has a very particular niche that it likes. It likes an area of, of of a rocky bottom, because all the seaweeds need a rocky bottom to hold on to, but it likes a sand scoured area. So there I found another batch. I made this image. And then I had to pair this incredible purple with this beautiful um, olive color of the egregia pods. And this, I will go into egregia because it's one of my favorites. Um, it's one of our really common kelps on the west coast. And I was collecting, I was realizing it has all these whimsical pods and that really the seaweeds deserve a place on our kitchen walls as much as the wildflowers or you know, uh, heirloom fruits or you know those posters that you find on your kitchen walls? Well, I think the seaweeds deserve a place there. Um, and so that was my attempt to make something in that category. So this is Egregia menziesii, or feather bo boa kelp. And feather boa kelp is, as I said, one of the very common kelps you'll find not only on the beach, but in the, the subtidal to really low intertidal. Um, it's a perennial, so its holdfast persists from year to year. And out on the Duxbury Reef, where I first started um, really looking for the seaweeds, there are a few holdfasts that I go back to every spring and um, uh, summer to kind of see how, and fall, to see, see their cycles. The first essay I wrote for the new book was about egregia, because I wanted to see if I could write a, 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 an essay, and I kind of titled it, I think I titled it Empathy for a Kelp. Could, could I write an essay about a kelp, a kelp that was so odd and so different from anything that we can relate to on what we know from our terrestrial world, from vascular plants, or anything we encounter in, in our, our, our land-based, gravity-based world. And could I describe it in a way that we really felt connected to it, to something so different from us? So that, um, it, it really does have pride of place as the first chapter. Um, this was a specimen, again, I found on the beach, and I'm able to capture this kind of jazzy quality. And one of the interesting things about egregia is that it has this incredible range of morphology or shape or form. Um, and originally, it was thought to be many different species. Uh, but then um, it came down to being decided, no, they are all Agrigia menziesii. Uh, Archibald Menzies is who um, discovered it, or was the first collector. Uh, he was out um, on the um, Vancouver expedition to the Pacific Northwest. And he was quite a wonderful, wonderful uh, collector. Uh, but you can see this incredible, um, incredible variety. Uh, the, this, it has this flat midrib uh, and these paddle-shaped blades, uh, but they can be elongated and almost needle-like, or they can be short and stout. The other thing about egregia is egregia is doing very well these days on our west coast. It's very adaptable to warmer and colder water. And that's pretty remarkable and something I think we're really taking note of for all sorts of species, is how adaptable are they to different ocean temperatures. Um, so egregia is uh, doing really well. And then in my life as an artist, as opposed to my life as a writer and designer, I started thinking, you know, I can explore using just the egregia blades um, and work as a, using them as a collage element. And I actually looked to another artist for inspiration here, and his name uh, is Rex Ray. And he's a San Francisco-based artist who unfortunately died in, in 2015. But he was kind of walked this line between graphic design and fine art. And he would make these beautiful um, sh um, organic shapes of paper. He'd make paper and cut out these shapes and then collage with them. And I thought, well, maybe I could do the same thing, but I'll use the blades or the various specimens that I have as those collage elements. 
And it kind of opened up a whole new pathway of art making for me that was kind of freeing. And I have to say, you know, if you're an artist or a graphic designer, go out and copy somebody. <laughs> it's not, it, you know, you're always going to be doing it in your own way. There was a um, huge exhibit about Matisse and Diebenkorn in San Francisco where Richard Diebenkorn just was copying Henri Matisse and came up with all this amazing artwork. It was very important to me. I've also been making cyanotype prints. Um, and early on, I had done some research into Anna Atkins. Uh, who is a real hero of mine and has gotten uh, quite a bit of um, notoriety lately. She, there's a show of her work in, in New York at the New York Public Library. And she uh, was this woman, a Victorian woman um, in around 1840. She made the first photographically reproduced book. And it was a book of algae. It was called British Algae Cyanotype Impressions. And she was a collector of the algae uh, of, around the coast of her home in Great Britain. And then she was experimenting with this very new method uh, of making imagery. It was very kind of the, the nascent photography. So in the history of photography, cyanotype is one of those very early processes where you make a, uh, a, 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 a sensitized emulsion that you put on your paper. Um, these are really fun and easy to do. And I've been doing all these workshops um, where, we, where I, I, I make cyanotypes with people. And it's a way to bring the science of the seaweeds. I use all my seaweed specimens to talk about the seaweeds as we're making the imagery. And then I realized when I really started thinking about Anna Atkins, and I was writing about her for the book because she comes up in the chapter on color, there is a tradition in botanical illustration that is called nature printing. And that's the process of printing directly from the specimen. So botanical illustration is usually looking at the specimen and then drawing perhaps an idealized version of the specimen. But when you're making an image from the specimen itself, you're capturing all the idiosyncrasies of that particular specimen. It's really a portrait of a particular thing. And I realized that my scanner, with using my scanner, I was following in that tradition of nature printing. Uh, which Anna Atkins was certainly doing, using her, making her cyanotype impressions. So I um, have just been recently experimenting with placing one of my scans into the cyanotype that I have made from that specimen. So it's very much about kind of crossing time uh, and place. Uh, and it's, I'm, I've got a whole other body of work. Uh, it's, it's in my head and partly on various hard drives. Um, but it's, it's kind of some of the next body of work that I'm going to be working on. So when I finished um, an ocean garden, and, and um, I really, I, there will never be, you know, I will never get to be enough of the seaweeds. I really wanted to dive deeper into particular species and try to tell their stories. And what that meant, and also try to understand the world of the taxonomy of seaweeds. We have a big, huge book, uh, The Marine Algae of California, and it has 650 species in it. And after each name, there's this whole line of people's names. And I didn't even, I didn't know what that meant, really. And so I started delving into the taxonomy of the seaweeds that I really loved, kind of these iconic um, seaweeds. And what I found was that taxonomy has a whole visual part of it, this, the, the history of describing these species, of, of, of generating these flora, has a visual component. And that, of course, is you know, what really um, makes me excited. So what you see here are the, some of the plates that are folded up to one of the really great first descriptions of California seaweeds. And it was written in 1853 by Franz Josef Ruprecht who was a German scientist writing in Russia at the time. And uh, a collection of seaweeds from California got sent back to Russia, and he named them. Uh, so the first part is, and it's five kelps and the seagrass, and uh, one seagrass. And so you have the descriptions in, in I think, in Russian and, uh, Russian, I think just in Russian and Latin. Um, but then in the back of this, of this folio are these folded up lithographs. And I got to go find, I got to go see the actual um, book um, uh, in the library of um, the UC libraries um, and found, 
Oh, this is actually from a PDF that's online, actually. Do you all know the, the website AlgaeBase? Yeah, oh, what a treasure trove, huh? I see people nodding. Yeah, it's fantastic. It has all these old um, documents. But Ruprecht had these lithographs made. And what I found is that when you pull them out, I actually got to encounter some of them uh, at one of these workshops. And when you unfolded those, those um, panels, this one of Agrigia here on the right is taller than me. It's spectacular. And one of the things that comes up that's always a question and is, how do you capture these enormous, majestic seaweeds when they're so big and we're confined to things like pages and scanners? And so Ruprecht decided to put a lot of the panels together. And when I encountered these, I thought, well, I would like to work in dialogue with these older images. Um, because they, 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 it creates a, a conversation of sorts across time and place. Um, and this was another very first image where I laid a scan of this particular um, uh, brown algae called Costaria costata, or five-ribbed kelp. And I laid it on top of another one of the lithographs from that Ruprecht folio, Dictio Neurum californica. Uh, they're related. They're not completely the same, but they're, they're, um, I think they're in the same family. And this, to me, created, started creating this energy, kind of like a vector through time and place. And vectors, of course, have an arrow on them, you know, from past to present. And then it's continuing, because it's very much about all of the work we're doing. It's like, well, where is this going? Where are these species headed? Um, that's always kind of part of why we're learning what we're learning. Um, so that has been really this body of work that, that drove the research of the new book. So I've been making the artwork alongside the research and writing of um, this book, The Curious World of Seaweed. This is part of that series. And this is um, Pyropia or Porphyra, Nori. Um, and our cal it, it's been Porphyra for many, many years. And then it got broken down into Pyropia. And the East Coast, I know the California ones are now are Pyropia, um, the East Coast versions. Um, I, I don't know whether they're Porphyra still or Pyropia. Um, but here, I've taken one of my scans and I've laid it onto the lithograph done by another great illustrator named Alexander Postels. And Alexander Postels was hired as the surgeon on board a Russian expedition to Alaska uh, that um, sailed to Alaska in 1829. And he turned out to have this amazing talent for illustration and for sketching. Um, and they collected a lot of the seaweeds of Alaska. And of course, a lot of the seaweeds of Alaska, their range uh, goes all the way down the West Coast to um, Washington, Oregon, and California. Um, and uh, Postels went back to Russia. And in 1840, he published this huge folio, called an elephant folio, called Illustrationis Algarum. And he paired up with Ruprecht, the describer. So Ruprecht described the species in, in Russian and Latin, and then uh, Postels made these enormous, fantastic lithographs. And if you are ever at the University of Southern California, this folio exists in their um, special collections libraries. You can ask for it. You can sit and spend a whole day with it. And it is truly um, a spectacular experience. So I started, um, I was able to get them over a number of years to digitize that um, and that's what libraries are so amazing about. I can't tell you how much I appreciate libraries and, and, and what they provide for us um, from all different disciplines. Um, so I was able to get digital files of the Postel's um, Illustraciones Algarum lithographs and then to work with them as an artist. And in fact, I just sent notice of the book to the librarian who helped me get those files. And I got such a lovely note back from her saying, this is why we do what we do. It's just a lovely, lovely um, rapport there. This is Ulva. And Ulva, like the porphyra that we just saw, is so thin and sheer. They're just two cells thick. And every single one of those cells can not only photosynthesize, but can access all the nutrients of the ocean. And that's really different than land-based. Uh, land-based plants, where everything is differentiated and roots do one thing and leaves do another. And trunks, of course, have to combat gravity. So all that energy has to go into being sturdy. The seaweeds just take a different strategy. And here, these really folios 
uh, seaweeds are maximizing their surface area to volume to catch as many photons to power photosynthesis. Um, and that there is diastromatic, I think is, anyway, it's a, it's a word that kind of means, two, is that it? Two, you know, two layers. Um, and so both of these really sheer seaweeds are only two, two cells thick, which is really cool. This is the, um, what used to be Cystocyra is now Stephanocystis, is another really common kelp on our west coast. You really, you find it strewn on the beach a lot, um, and it's uh, really a very common seaweed out there in the subtital, kind of making um, an understory, just like in the forest you have the big guys, and then you have this understory kelp that is creating all sorts of habitat. Uh, and and the, the Stephanocystis um, really is holding that ground there. Now, one of the things I've tried to do in each chapter uh, of the book where I'm focusing on a particular seaweed or kelp is, is I'm looking really hard at the images first, and that usually gets me to ask some of the questions that drives my research. And as I was looking at Stephanocystis here, and of course I've layered it onto one of these fantastic Ruprecht lithographs, I noticed that you know, typically the kelps, the kelps which are the most differentiated seaweeds, uh, and they are the only subset of the marine algae that have the, the bladders, the air bladders, or the pneumatocysts, well, usually the pneumatocysts are functioning to hold those blades up towards the surface to capture more sunlight. Um, so usually you have like the blades coming out of the pneumatocyst. And I looked at this hard and I was like, wait a second, the blades are at the bottom and these, these bladder chains, they're kind of diminutive air bladders, they're up at the top. That seemed to be a reverse um, situation and that kind of drove me to asking about that and it turns out that this particular seaweed holds a place not in the deeper subtitle, it's in the wave zone. So it is hit by those uh, winter storm surge and our California winters, that's when the big storms come in and a lot of these seaweeds take a real beating. Um, so those, this top, more delicate bladders get washed off. That's what you find on the beach. And those blades persist uh, down at the bottom through the winter because this is a perennial. Um, so again, it was, it was kind of that, that, that's something I actually learned when I made my very first book on beach stones. I got to work with a wonderful science writer named Margaret Carruthers. And as I was making the images of each stone, just questions would come up is why does it look like this? And that she was able to take those questions and translate it into these very wonderful um, um, descriptions and explanations for where that stone came from. So this is my evolution from that project. So here is the curious world of seaweed. Um, and I hope you guys all get a chance. I hope the book comes into your library so you have it there to to read through the ideas. You can read each chapter, um, and it's you kind of accrete information as you go along, but they're pretty discreet, um, and you can dip into it uh, as you see fit. Um, and it is organized. Um, there are 16, there was going to be 15 uh, chapters, 15 seaweeds, um, and then there just had to be a 16th. I couldn't leave Terragophora out. It's, a, it's, it's one of our really important kelps. Uh, on the west coast and it tends to not get the, the story because it's not a canopy forming kelp. So when aerial surveys are done or research has talked about the situation of the kelps, the pterogopher tends to get left out. So I had to put it in and, and, and this is only 16. And I wanna say here that we, the seaweeds, you guys who've been out with Brian, you know the abundance that is there and what you have here on your east coast, you have to actually kind of triple for what we have on our west coast. It, I think there are originally 650 species named in the marine algae of California, but at this point there's probably 750, you know, there's a lot more that have been named since 1976 when that was written. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about why, like the, the abundance that we have on our west coast. Um, and Talking about our geology and, and our situation might let you think about, well, what is different here? What don't we have in, in here in the, um, I guess we're not the Gulf of Maine, but uh, the, what waterway are we in here? Okay, there you go, okay. 
So out on the coast of California, in the springtime, we have this phenomenon that's incredibly important for all of the marine life, and that is an upwelling event that happens in the spring. And that's because we have these uh, northwesterly trade winds that come in, and they push the surface waters away, and they let this deeper, super nutrient-rich uh, deep waters well up. Uh, and it also has the, another factor is that our continental shelf is pretty close to our coastline. So that also um, enhances the upwelling. And, that, and, and it's cold ocean. So these big kelps, these robust and large organisms, they need cold ocean. The cold ocean holds much more nutrients uh, and allows for this incredible growth. Our big kelps can grow uh, 10, 12 centimeters a day. They'll grow 60 feet uh, in a matter of months. Uh, it's an enormous amount of growth. Your sugar kelp grows uh, really, really fast, at least up in the northern waters where it's colder. Um, so our upwelling, this is the coast of Mendocino County, um, where you have this rough terrain. Uh, this is, I think, in January. Uh, and, and the seaweeds, um, they all love this rough, cold water they get in the, uh, in the winter. Um, this is the fall time. This is the incredible rack that the detritus that gets churned up by those winter storms throws so much of this detritus onto the shore. And it's just important to always remember when we're talking about kind of the whole ecology of the kelp forest and the seaweeds, that they support so many other organisms. And their detritus is actually super, super important for whole ecologies. Um, not only are a lot of the invertebrates uh, detritus feeders, like the abalone that we have out there and the urchins all just feed on stuff that's floating in the water column, uh, but once it's on shore, all of the invertebrates and the flies and the insects that decompose this material, this kelp material, think of what incredible bounty that is for shorebirds. And think of it as you know, shorebirds who are migrating south in the fall and need all that energy. Super important. Um, and then all sorts of uh, nutrients go up into the nearshore ecologies. So it's good to remember it has all sorts of functions um, besides uh, the, the habitat that it creates uh, and the um, uh, um, under, underwater. So this is up close on this detritus. Um, and you can see all this incredible uh, um, color and kind of shape. And I just love this stuff. And if you find the right confluence of the geography, a cove, and the current, you'll find these great piles of seaweed rack. Um, so all those colors really represent that we just saw. Um, you really can see probably the reds, the greens, and the browns in there um, represent the three color groups that form the basic taxonomic groups of how we categorize our seaweeds. Um, and these uh, were put in place by William Henry Harvey, a fantastic Irishman. He was actually a Quaker from Ireland. He worked out of the University of Trinity, Trinity University in Dublin. Um, and in about ooh, 1840 or so, oh yes, it was, it was around Anna Atkins' time. In 1840, he was able to notice that the spores of the seaweeds were these, these circles of super color. And he created these three categories uh, of, of, of the seaweeds uh, that are still used today as our basic uh, groupings from which to begin to fi figure out what, what it is. And these are evolutionary lines of seaweed. And um, the, the, um, the greens, uh, this is ulva. And ulva is kind of a signature green seaweed. It is super green. And that green is made from chlorophyll and chlorophyll alone, chlorophyll A and B, and it is super green. You can't really miss it. It's Kelly green, um, and it collects, uh, uh, the chlorophyll is very good at collecting red, day, red light, the red wavelength of light, which is what our daylight is. And we really take it for granted what our daylight is, but when you're a seaweed and you're not necessarily getting daylight, you might have to come up with some alternate strategies for collecting different wavelengths of light. And that is what the red seaweed, oops, sorry, the red seaweeds have done. The reds here um, have two accessory pigments to collect different wavelengths of light that actually penetrate the denser ocean waters, uh, which might be green and blue wavelengths. 
Well, there's a, a red and a blue pigment that are accessory pigments in the red seaweeds that help collect those different wavelengths of light. So these are strategies um, that we might you know, not think about as land-based, you know, red-oriented um, uh, people. Um, so that's the reds. And then the browns uh, are a much later evolutionary line, and they have a brown accessory pigment that combine with chlorophyll. So there is also chlorophyll in the reds, but the red and blue pigments tend to overpower them and make these red colors and these incredible colors of purple and pink. Uh, the browns have a brown accessory pigment that combines with the chlorophyll to make these colors of olive and brown and golden colors. Um, like I said, these are evolutionary lines. The green seaweeds gave rise to all of our vascular plants. That's where the chlorophyll of our plant, of our land-based world comes from, all those green leaves. Um, and the browns are quite a, a, an older evolutionary line than the greens and the reds, which all evolved from cyanobacteria. I'll let you read that. The, the, um, the chapter on um, evolution uh, includes the story of Lynn Margulis, who's just one of the most kick-butt awesome scientists ever. Um, and uh, that is the chapter on the green, on ulva, the greens. But there's also a chapter on color. Uh, and this is the image that introduces that chapter, because we have a seaweed uh, called Maziella volans uh, that just is this amazing purple, especially once you dry it. Um, Oh no, this isn't, sorry, this isn't Maziella volans. That was my, this is Maziella splendens. Um, and uh, this is a dried specimen. So I can, as I said, I can put these onto my scanner, either dry or wet. Uh, and this, and I again made this image where I placed it into the cyanotype. But I want to go into one story in particular, and that is the story of our bull kelp. Bull kelp is the dominant kelp that creates the kelp forests of our northern, Cal like stretching from about central California around the Monterey Peninsula, up through northern California, through Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, and Alaska. And it ends in the middle of the Aleutians Islands. It is a spectacular organism. These bull kelp, when you find them on the beach, they're so massive. Um, when they're mature bull kelp. They're just these extraordinary, extraordinary organisms. And they do all of their growing in one season. They are annuals. Some of them overwinter um, from year to year, but typically their life cycle is to do this extraordinary amount of growing from early spring to late summer, and then do their reproductive work, and then the entire organism gets picked up by the winter storms uh, and, um, and swept away. And um, again, so these um, are the dominant kelp in the, they like rougher water, in the colder waters of Northern California. It's not that easy to dive up there and to study them. Our Southern California kelps are much, well, um, much more well known. They're better studied. It's much easier to dive and to, to, to um, work down in Southern California. Um, I did a whole series. I was the kelp ambassador to the Pacifica Beach Coalition's Ocean Heroes month or two. Uh, and they chose kelp as their ocean hero. And so um, I gave talks to lots of um, elementary school kids. And I used the bull kelp as a way to just talk about the basic seaweed architecture um, because it's so clear. And you guys probably know this, but all the kelps and seaweeds, uh, to survive, they have to hold on to a rocky bottom. And they do that with a hold fast. Uh, so that's what you see here. Um, the bull kelp's hold fast is remarkably small, given how big this organism gets. Um, it has a stipe, not a stem, but a stipe. And it has to be very hydrodynamic um, because the bull kelp, uh, despite that small hold fast, actually likes um, rough water. Um, it's out in, in, the, in the surf zone. Uh, it has a very sturdy bladder. Um, uh, gas-filled bladder, and then these uh, beautiful blades. These are, um, uh, these are juveniles or teenagers, um, but once it's mature, you'll have 60 to 70 to 80, these incredible blades that stream out along the surface of the ocean and just um, are soaking in those, uh, those uh, rays of sunshine. Here I put these two together, and I didn't really realize the similarity between um, my scan of, of a couple of juvenile um, uh, Neriocystis or bull kelp and Alexander Postel's version. And again, 
like, like Brian was saying, it's hard to get these fabulous and, and um, uh, rambunctious organisms onto the confines of a page or to communicate their um, flamboyance uh, on, on, on the confines of a herbarium sheet or a, a pa paper or my um, scanner platen. Uh, and so we had a similar strategy. These are some of the um, juvenile or baby nereos. And uh, Brian has some in the back. Uh, in, early, in, in early spring, maybe late February, um, early March, the, the nereocystis um, start to grow from these very uh, simple um, kelp. They don't even have a bladder yet. And then they develop their, their bladder and a few blades. Uh, and in a matter of months, um, they are um, turning into this by June or July. Uh, over your spring semester, uh, that cold ocean, all of those longer days of sunshine, which are a cue for all this light, this growth to start happening, you can have an organism that's reaching uh, 50 or 60 feet up towards the ocean surface. And here um, are a couple photographs of our kelp forest. Uh, they're taken by a wonderful student at uh, University of California at Santa Barbara, a guy named Marco Maza, who's a free diver. And he takes uh, some spectacular uh, images. He was very, very kind to let me borrow them for um, a lot of these uh, talks. And I could go on and on about the importance of the kelp forest as habitat, uh, as oxygenator, as carbon sink. Uh, um, but I'm going to focus on the seaweeds themselves. But that, we have to keep that in mind, uh, that these kelp forests and, and seaweed, the seaweeds create an enormous amount of habitat um, for all sorts of organisms. Uh, we have rockfish on the west coast. And I learned recently that rockfish can grow to be 150 years old. A fish, 150 years old. But the rockfish need habitat. They need safe places to be to grow that old. So the rockfish population, there are lots of different species of rockfish uh, on the west coast, but they, their populations are super dependent on healthy kelp forest, as, as are so many other um, organisms. Uh, larval um, uh, invertebrates all need uh, safe places to grow to maturity. Uh, and the kelp forest um, creates that. All sorts of uh, uh, fish who have predators um, need places to hide. Um, one thing, just to go back here, one of the things actually I found in terms of communication and stressing the importance of the seaweeds is I've also found that, that emphasizing how much oxygen these organisms produce is a way to kind of capture people's attention to like, oh, it's not just the trees that are making all our, our oxygen that we breathe. And you point out that not only do the single-celled algae create you know, the, 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 the preponderance of our atmospheric oxygen, but that the, um, the marine algae, the macroalgae, create a significant portion or percentage. Um, and that makes people really think about the algae as, as, as a new way of thinking of how important it is. So this bull kelp has to um, get through its life cycle before the end of the summer, before the winter storms come. And they create these, these spore patches emerge in late summer, and they're called sori. Uh, and there's millions and millions of spores. I'm able to put these blades right onto my scanner. Um, and I just think they're so fabulous. I can even capture this very pale line that, that evolves around the edge of the sori or the spore patch. Which, where the cells are just going to part away, and the whole patch will fall right to the bottom, to the ocean bottom, which will usually probably be a, a rocky bottom. It will pro the odds are uh, it's, it's the same habitat as its parent. So the odds are that it's a good habitat for these uh, uh, young uh, the spores to propagate. Um, they have an alternate life cycle, uh, which is very tiny and microscopic and um, involves egg and sperm, or gametes, a term I swore I would never use because I didn't understand it when I first started out, but um, a, a sexual phase. But that sexual phase is so tiny. And it happens down in the rocks in the middle of winter. So it's, in fact, very not well. It is, it is not well understood. Um, I have just recently come upon a group that is trying to restore kelp, the, the bull kelp in Puget Sound. 
And I've seen uh, some um, of those, um, the, the egg and sperm uh, and those gametophytes uh, in a picture from a microscope. Uh, but they haven't had very good success in actually um, kind of generating the full life cycle in, in the lab. Um, so that's a part of the bull kelp that for me holds its allure is that we don't, we don't know it fully. We really don't. Um, and that's part of its majesty to me is that it's holding its, its secrets um, close to its chest. This is what this is um, from a snorkeling expedition uh, a couple of years ago. This is late August up on the Mendocino coast. And what those, um, this is what you see in the, in the late summer, early fall, when the bull kelp is dropping its spore patches, its sori. And it really does make these holes. It's almost like um, you've, you've cut your cookies out of the dough, and that edge of the dough is just hanging on there. It's very stringy. And, um, and this is a picture of where I was snorkeling. It took, that, th it took this picture in 2017. And this is a picture of that cove. It's Van Damme State Park. Um, and it's a place where lots of, uh, of diving, surveying, kayaking, lots of, of activity in Van Damme State Park uh, on the Mendocino Coast. And this was taken in 2008. You can just see the amount of biomass there is out there. I mean, you could just try to estimate the weight of it. I mean, birds could just walk across this without any problem. Um, in, tw in 2017, this I was in the exact same place, and I was in a kayak, and I took this picture. You can see there's a lot of space here compared to that last picture. There's a very distinct edge to this um, bed of kelp here. And I was just up there about three weeks ago, um, and it was, no, it was middle August, so it should have been when there was uh, a good amount of kelp, and this is what there is now. We have a huge catastrophe of our bull kelp forest kind of happening in real time up on the Mendocino coast. What's really interesting to me is to go out to Van Damme State Park. I was there on the most beautiful day. This is what it looked like, a glistening day. And if you don't have those pictures that we've just seen, this would feel absolutely normal. Who would know? And for me, I'm really interested in that. How do we make sure that norm this doesn't become the normal? But we have this tendency to take what we're seeing now, and unless we have some historicity uh, and some image in our mind, and I think it's the power of imagery um, to say, oh, wait a second. This, this I mean, I may, might be the new normal, but it's um, keeping, keeping this kind of image as part of the story of this place uh, is something I really want to investigate in, in my forthcoming, um, in my next projects. So what's happening there? Why is this kelp disappearing? On the left, you have this beautiful uh, nereo or bull kelp. And on the right, uh, you have what I saw when I was out there, which is these sea urchins have actually taken this majestic bull kelp. It's still attached by its holdfast to the bottom. And it's actually pinned the blades of the holdfast to this vertical wall face. And urchins are just voracious kelp eaters. Uh, so all over the world, every you know, every temperate ocean of, of, of our, our world's oceans or coastline uh, of our world's oceans has this kind of ongoing battle between urchins and kelp. Uh, so there might be different kelp species. It might be different species of sea urchin. Uh, but there's all, we always have this, you know, voracious herbivore going after this tasty herb, the kelp. Um, and uh, on the north coast of California right now, we've had this absolute explosion of the purple sea urchin in particular. And that explosion in the population uh, has happened for a number of reasons. Um, it has, um, and this is what we get, is these urchin barrens. So there's this pretty quick um, uh, regime shift from kelp forest to urchin barren. Uh, and there were a number of factors that came into play between 2013 and 2016. Uh, and they were, number one, we had this warm blob come down and sit off of California um, and the whole West Coast. And we had very warm water for a couple of years. We also had a starfish wasting disease. Um, and one of the main predators of the urchins is a wonderful deep water, large 
starfish called the sunflower starfish, or Pycnopodia. And that um, starfish wasting disease really, really wiped out starfish, all starfish species, all up and down our west coast uh, from 2013 to 2016. And in particular, it wiped out those what were called wolves of the sea, this fast-moving um, Pycnopodia or sunflower star. Other starfish have started to come back. If you come to our coastline now, you'll see all sorts of intertidal starfish. But the Pycnopodia have not come back. And they were holding down a niche that was vacated by the sea otter. So all of our kelp and seaweeds on our west coast evolved with a top predator in the system that kept herbivores, I mean, yeah, herbivores, those voracious um, echinoderms like the, the urchin and um, the other invertebrate, the um, abalone is a big kelp eater, um, in control. And there weren't, a, maybe there were maybe 300,000 sea otter in their native range of the west coast up through the Aleutians down to northern uh, Japan uh, prior to about 1800. Uh, but between 1750 about and 1850, uh, the um, North American fur trade, uh, the Pacific fur trade, um, actually completely wiped out the otter population. So that's taking out this top predator. It was discovered, um, and that's a whole fabulous story, um, that, um, that the otter fur was extremely valuable on the Chinese market, and it was the Steller expedition, or it was the burying expedition that had Joseph Steller on board that got shipwrecked and but they kept just a few otter pelts were stored under one of the, um, one of the um, sailors' bunks uh, because they had to throw everything overboard to get back to Russia. It was ordered that everything, even all of George Steller's careful specimens that he had prepared. But one sailor kept some sea otter pelts. And the sea otter has no blubber. So it has a very, very thick fur to keep it from getting hypothermic in the cold Pacific Ocean. Um, and that's why it has such thick fur and why its pelts were so valuable. Everybody rushed on board, the Russians and the English, the Americans, the Spanish got in there. Um, and they just killed them indiscriminately. And by 1911, um, they, were pretty, they were ecologically extinct on the West Coast. That was a long time ago. By, by, I mean, by 1850, they were ecologically extinct. And their story has, in many places on the West Coast, their story has been left out of when we talk about seaweed because they compete with humans for things that we want. There is a, a, a urchin fishery. The red urchin is actually what you, the uni of your sushi. Uh, so the red urchin are quite valuable and there's a lot of uh, fishermen who fish for red urchin. The abalone is a big um, recreational fishery in Northern California. People love to dive for abalone. Um, and when the, um, the otter were wiped out, all of those, uh, that nearshore abundance grew. Uh, and so um, that became, that's part of kind of what I write about. I try to bring the otter back into the story as much as I can. Um, trophic cascade, top predator, when it's there, the urchins are in control. When they're not there, the urchins go out of control. Um, I'm really trying to connect the sea urchin with um, the, the Nereocystis in particular um, because I think that story has been forgotten. And there is this fantastic woman named Edna Fisher. And Edna Fisher, when a little raft of sea otter were rediscovered on the West Coast in 1938, there was a professor at San Francisco State University named Edna Fisher. And she immediately was down on the coast of Big Sur looking at that um, refugial population of otter with her binoculars, recording all of their behavior. And she started writing all of the first papers about the sea otter and their behavior. And she was always describing them in the bull kelp in particular. And alongside her papers uh, are these wonderful drawings uh, and paintings. The otter would wrap themselves up in the kelp so they don't float away when they need to rest. Um, they also, uh, the mamas and their pups, the nursery was right there in the bull kelp. Uh, and the mamas put their pups in a pool while they go down to dive for food so the pups don't wash away um, and end up somewhere else. Um, and I connected this with the fact that when you read the very first descriptions of bull kelp by that expedition up to Alaska, um, they, the, the naturalists on board uh, the expedition, Mertens, 
says that the Russian sailors called the bull kelp sea otter cabbage because it was where they saw the sea otter playing. They would literally climb onto these big tubular kelps and jump off and play. And so that association isn't really talked about when the ecologies of Northern California are discussed. And so that's part of um, why I'm writing these stories. Um, so this is my homage, homage to uh, that bull kelp. Um, but let's go on to a few others. This is a fabulous um, Wixia. I'm just going to go through some of the other ones that, that um, we'll find in the book. It's this fabulous red, the Mrs. J.M. Weeks. One of the things I've done in this book is I've given you treasures in looking at the ID on the herbarium pressings that I've included. So the Mrs. Weeks comes up quite early on, and you don't really know who she is until you get to the 15th chapter, I think it is, which is Weeksia. Um, and there's a wonderful, wonderful, more contemporary scientist named Isabella Abbott uh, who followed up on the study of this particular species um, and kind of took it on. Uh, and um, she's a real mentor to many, many of the phycologists that I know uh, today. And every once in a while, I meet someone who worked with Isabella Abbott. So as you can see, there's a theme here of women scientists um, really kind of expanding our knowledge of the, Cal the West Coast seaweeds. Uh, in a really real, real way. And these women scientists are kind of also, of course, expanding our knowledge of the oceans as a whole. I mean, they are, it all goes together. This is the Postelsia. We have some fabulous specimens collected by Brian in the back. It is this wonderfully charismatic tree. It's called sea palm, and it's kind of our state um, kelp, maybe. It's, a, it's a, actually a protected organism. You can't collect this unless you have a very special permit. Um, and it really is like this little palm tree, but it, it actually exists in the most exposed wave crashed rocks. So what you'll see the Postelsia do is that it, it goes completely prostrate and then it pops back up as every wave crashes over it. Um, and I've overlaid it with one of the Ruprecht uh, lithographs. Um, and I've also included in the Postelsia chapter the cover of one of my most precious um, um, uh, library acquisitions, which is the yearbook that was made uh, by a woman named Josephine Tilden. Uh, and she was the woman who started the very first marine lab to exist on the West Coast. And, and the West Coast, we have tons of marine labs. Every university has a marine lab somewhere, and they all um, are doing incredible research. Well, in 1900, the very first marine lab was established on the very wild and rugged west coast of Vancouver Island by uh, Josephine Tilden. And it was called the Minnesota Seaside Station because she was a professor uh, uh, in, in, in 1899, a professor um, of biology at the, at the University of Minnesota. And she would bring students from the Midwest, half of them girls or women, young women, out uh, on an eight-day journey by train out to the west coast of Vancouver. And they would, st this spectacular bench uh, with all these fabulous tide pools to study the marine algae in particular. And one of the things that you find out there is incredible coral and algae. Now, you guys know coral and algae are super fundamental to all of the um, the, the nearshore intertidal uh, ecologies all over the world. They, they create this really foundational, this kind of base. Uh, and you have both encrusting coralline, which you see here, and you have articulated coralline. Now, the coralline take this strategy against being eaten by those herbivores by actually um, building calcium, calcium carbonate in their cell walls. So they kind of act like a shell. I mean, in fact, uh, Linnaeus thought they were an animal and categorized them in the animal kingdom uh, initially. And it took about 50 years for it to get switched over uh, into the algae. Um, and this is an incredible bottle that represents all of the encrusting al uh, coral and algae that you find encrusting on the rocks. Uh, and they're important not only to um, uh, other seaweeds, but also to larval organisms. Here's our great macrocystis. There's a chapter on this. Um, and it, it, is a per, it is a perennial. Its holdfast persists from year to year. Uh, and these are its sporophyll blades. So unlike the neriocystis where the, the spore patches are out on the blades, these are down at the base of the plant. 
Um, and this is what you find on the beach and what's really set me, set me going. Um, a garum. You guys have a garum here. Hopefully you have found some colander kelp. It's so spectacular. This was a, a specimen that got pulled up with an anchor um, uh, up in the Gulf, in the um, Penobscot Bay in Maine. And the story of a garum, I'm going to let you read it in the book, but it's really about how these specimens, like you see in the back, can really transport you across place and time. Because these agarum, these lithographs were from the very first flora of the marine algae, written in 1768. Uh, and, but they were using the specimens collected by George Steller a generation earlier, um, in the 1720s. Or, mm, do I have that right? Um, and that he had shipped across the Siberian Peninsula. And then, 100 years later, Postel's made these incredible lithographs. So there's a wonderful story there. And I just want to finish up here with mentioning the eel grasses and the, and the um, marine grasses. These are not algae. They're actually flowering plants. Um, and in California, we have not only the Zostra marina or the eel grass, but we also have surf grass, which exists out in the intertidal in a little bit deeper and, and uh, rougher waters. Um, there's a wonderful epiphyte. Uh, where the spores of this beautiful red algae called Smithora will only land on the eelgrass and uh, the surf grass, excuse me. Um, and we get a lot of this uh, matting the surf grass in the springtime. Uh, and there's all sorts of eelgrass restoration. Of course, like the kelps, it's a fantastic carbon sink. It's a in fa in fantastic oxygenator uh, of those nearshore waters. Um, it mitigates um, uh, um, wave action and um, if we have storm surges. Um, and of course, it creates incredibly important habitat. The herring row uh, love to land on the eelgrass. Um, and it's this three-dimensional habitat. So we'll finish here. And this is just this one of these amalgams that I've made it where I'm inter interweaving my contemporary scan, excuse me, with these historical elements to kind of just reiterate the point that Everything in these e ecosystems is so interconnected. And there are layers of knowledge uh, that is associated with the seaweeds that we don't even know yet. Um, so I'm so excited you guys are out there studying this stuff. And I'm so excited to go snorkeling tomorrow and see what we find here. And I think we have time for maybe some questions. Um, and thank you guys so much. Any questions? Yeah. That was the other question. You've presented your work to a, a wide range of audiences. And I'm always struck in science, there's a lot of terminology, nomenclature, the Latin names. On the other hand, there's common names. There's common terms that we can use. And you were, in this presentation, using both. And I wonder if you could speak to how do you choose <coughs> when you're considering your audience? This is really a science communication. Yeah. You know, what, what do you find? I'm sure for your elementary school kids, you know, you're, you're presenting more of you know, a certain way versus a, um, at the, the algae um, conferences, right? What's, I mean, you're kind of a rare person that you've spoken to that wide range of audiences. How do yes. you choose how to tailor your, your use of language? Well, I try to include both. And so something like nori, nori is a term that's very specific to porphyra or, or pyropia. And so I like to go back and forth so that I, it took me a long time myself to learn the Latin names. But if you keep at it, you can learn them. Even me, if I can learn them, anybody can learn them. But I learn them by repetition and by just seeing them over and over again. So I actually, even with the elementary school kids, I throw the Latin names in there. I put them up to read visually in, my, in um, an ocean garden. Uh, this book is very, it's a primer. It's for anybody. It's for a, a really wide range of readers. But every Latin name is in there. And the same is true with, with the new book. Because I think just, um, and on even my curtains, I put the Latin name on there. Because um, I think the more you see it, the more familiar you get with just saying egregia. And then it becomes a, like a friend, like, a, like the name of, well, egregia is like my buddy, you know? <laughs> It is my buddy, sorry, but it is. Um, so feather boa kelp, though, is very descriptive. And I feel like, ooh, I didn't use the term tonight, feather boa kelp, as much. 
but I would, I probably would have in a more California-based um, term because that term is used a lot. Bull kelp is used a lot. Um, giant. So, so I'll go. I'll flip back and forth. But I, but I do feel like the more the, the Latin names are out there, and then for someone like me, like I don't learn birds and I don't learn trees, <laughs> so I can keep the algal names in my head. Um, and so, yeah. Anything else? Get your scanners out there, guys. Take pictures. Use your eye, you know, the, uh, the seeing is so, I just want to say seeing is so important and it takes you into places. So tell your friends who are artists that, you know, this is an incredible world, um, the marine algae, and it's got so many cool stories. Um, and I think we have books in the back, and yeah. Yeah, there are, I was just going to say, there are books in the back, they're on sale for $28, which is a seal. Um, so definitely take advantage of that if you want, and um, would you be willing to sign? Yes, oh absolutely, 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 of course. And I oh, also, so I have a newsletter, it's a very sporadic newsletter from my, um, uh, from my studio, but when I'm doing cyanotype workshops, or if I'm coming and doing a talk like this, I kind of put the word out. Um, I have scarves and shower curtains and you know, post pictures from various events, so if you want to get on my newsletter, there's a um, uh, list in the back. And thank you guys, this is really fabulous.